Hi, I love this topic. It's a great topic. Take notes. And I am not kidding. I'm Paul Friedman. These are the seven rules of marriage. And if you follow these rules, your marriage is going to be amazing. Now, the Ten Commandments. We all know them. No, we don't. I can't recite them. But those are like the top line, right? And then we need to learn how to put those into operation. There's all these subcategories. So the same is true for marriage. But don't be afraid to infuse your own creativity. And when I give you one, think of different ways to apply it. I'll help you a little bit. I'll do my best. But also, you do it too. So these are the seven rules. Number one, this is absolute. This is why we get married. I'm going to get into this, by the way. Learn to love unconditionally. That word unconditional, when we attach it to love, has so much power because it's the only thing that matters, learning to love unconditionally. Where do we see unconditional love? What comes to mind usually is the mother's love, isn't it? There's a higher unconditional love, and that's from God. We're not going to go there in this case because we don't want to turn it into a religious sermon, and this is not a religious organization, but marriage is spiritual. Marriage is not some mundane contract that we have with someone who we've decided to form a partnership with for the rest of our lives. No, this is deep. You see, essentially, we're spiritual beings because essentially we are souls. We are. We don't have a soul. We are a soul and we have a body and we have a mind and we have a life and now we have a husband or a wife. Learning to love them unconditionally is part of the spiritual path. And I have redefined marriage into an individual spirit. Listen to this and think about it. It's an individual spiritual path that two soulmates take together in their life. Why is it a spiritual path? It's a spiritual path because we're seeking love, number one. Sometimes happiness, number one, but they're interchangeable. But when you have love, you have happiness. You cannot have love and not be happy. It's impossible. And this has been proven throughout history in any scenario. People who have been suffering like crazy, but they have love, they're happy anyway. Learn to love unconditionally. In my meditations, I say to God, teach me, O Lord, to love as thou dost love me. In your marriage, this should be like your prime objective. Learn to love them unconditionally. You can do it. There's nothing about this that should push you away. Nothing. And if something is, write to us. Write to our counselors. It's a free service. Just go to our website, ask a counselor, and explain why you can't love your spouse unconditionally. You want them to love you unconditionally. They want that. But when you learn to love unconditionally, whether they love you or not, because none of us are really capable, but it's learning to love unconditionally. When you do that, you will float, I promise you. Number two, this ties in, but I'm putting it in these terms because it's a little easier to grasp. Number two is be a giver, not a taker. I had a dream recently. I shared this with my wife. It included our kids. This may sound a little strange to you, but I'm thinking, okay, it just came to me to share it with you. My wife and I were dead, and we were living on a plane in between this plane, this world. I hope this doesn't frighten you away. I'm not weird, truly. And the next plane, the astral, heaven. And God came to us, and we, in, our, in this dream of mine, my wife and I could go back and forth between this plane and that plane and multiple planes. Don't know why. 
dream. And in this particular case, God said, I want you to give a test to your children because they're about to pass on to determine where they go, which heaven they go. Because heaven's a gazillion levels, right? And so there's a heaven where everything is black and white. Now, in no heaven is it worse than hell on earth because earth is kind of a hell, but there's levels and it's none of them are worse because we don't have a body. And these bodies are huge encumbrances. They feel pain, they get sick and all that stuff. They get old and they die. And if they answered incorrectly, they would go to the black and white heaven. If they answered correctly, they would go to the spectacular astral colors heaven. And the question was, where you go next? Do you want to be of service or do you want to be the one served? And we know our kids, right? I didn't want to ask that question. And I told God, no, I'm not doing it. I'm sorry, because I know. And we talked to our kids afterwards and I told them about the dream. And one of my daughters started cracking up and said, I know what I would answer. And the other one said, what? I, obvious, I want to serve. But that's why I didn't want to ask the question, because I knew and I didn't want to be the one to send her. We could have our marriage be heaven, but we need to learn to give. Taking is easy, but we don't receive any benefit. Being a giver means that we're manifesting the love that we have for our spouse, and it makes your marriage grow. Number three, <laughs> I guess there's a theme here. Care about your spouse more than you do about yourself. I know that in this world, that's asking a lot. So what? Here's the benefits of living your marriage according to the rules. The benefit is you're floating in joy all the time. It's true. If you are taking care of yourself, there's no room for others to take care of you. But when you're taking care of your spouse, you're expressing that love. And when you care more about them, you're expressing that love. And whether they care for you or not, really won't matter to you, truly. This is a conundrum, you know. The spiritual life, and marriage is a spiritual life, is a conundrum because the more we give, the more we get, not as a reciprocation, but it's how it just works. But if we have this expectation of receiving and we want, we want, we want, we don't see all that we're actually getting. So care more about your spouse than yourself. Number four, this is interesting. You know, I used to be a divorce mediator as almost 23 years ago. And so when I started helping couples with their marriages, most of them who contacted me said, our communication isn't good. At that time, around 2000s, this was the thing. Everyone thought my communication is not Now they think, oh, my husband's a narcissist. My wife is this, my husband, blah, 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 blah. It's all crazy. We shouldn't be working on our marriages in the negative way of getting rid of the bad stuff. We should be working on our marriages in a positive way, changing our thinking, changing our approach to positive. That's how we do it at the Marriage Foundation. It's all positive. It's all about love. So communicate with love. Communication is important in a marriage. There's two people. There's a lot of ways to communicate. There's with words, there's with looks, there's with touch, there's with feeling. All of it 
should not leave us to them if it is not wrapped up and infused with love. It's a law. It's a simple rule to follow. If you can't say something that is infused with love, don't say it. It can wait. Don't have to get it out. You know, they teach this now and it's wrong that you have to vent. You have to let them know what's on your mind. They call that opening up. That's not opening up. That's dumping your garbage on someone else's lawn. Opening up is learning to love unconditionally. Go back to that. Opening your heart. Put a door on your heart. Visualize a door. Door of my heart. Open wide. Let the liquid love flow to them. In thought, in feeling, and words, expressions, and touch. It's a rule. Follow it. You'll see. It'll change everything. All right. Number five, <laughs> this is a good one. By the way, I don't always do this. Oftentimes, if you're a subscriber, then you know my ways, a lot of it. You wonder, why is he laughing? Because I see humor in my own things sometimes. But if you're not a subscriber, you should subscribe so you can really learn how to be married. So do that right now. Okay, number five, remember that your partner is human. We forget. We forget. What am I talking about? Any little slip up and we start feeling, thinking critically. Our mind right away points out what's wrong. We forget they're human and that they have flaws. In my office, I was not a marriage counselor the way marriage counselors traditionally behave. I don't go, so how does that make you feel? And neither do the ones we're training now. The ones who are becoming marriage are learning how I did it. I had a whiteboard in my office, four by eight, because I was a divorce mediator. And this was practical. And so what I would do is I would put seven dots, black dots on my whiteboard. And I would ask them individually, what do you see? Almost, I, I say almost because I can't remember anyone doing it differently. Everyone said seven black dots. Is that a setup? And I would say, so you didn't notice four feet by eight feet of white. Your eye went right to the black dots. Isn't it true? And we go, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, because that's how we live our lives. We are governed by fear. We are governed by fear because we're governed by our biology. And our biology is trillions of cells all put together. And what can we say about every single cell? Every single living cell is governed by the drive to survive, self preservation. And so what happens is we don't take charge of our mind and the mind is just a machine. Instead, we are run by our minds. We are run by the drive to survive. The drive to survive means we're watching out for something that's wrong. Nothing wrong with that. If you are keeping it in check and it's just a little sidebar for your life, but if it's running your whole life, you become consumed. And where are we going to see it first? With the person we live with, of course. And so we point out their flaws and we say something to them and we are not forgiving of their errors in judgment, their errors in behaviors. We're not forgiving. We forget they're human. We don't want them to forget we're human, but we forget they are human. And it is bad to do that. It's not fair because we live with them. We see everything. We hear their farts. We hear them when they're going to the bathroom. We, we know every nuance about them. But do we look at their positive traits? Do we tell them how wonderful they are when they do something that is 
out of the ordinary. No. So this is a rule of marriage. Remember, your partner is human. Love them. Not in spite of that, that they're human. Just learn to love them. Number six. This is so important. Did you know what the number one spiritual law is? It's loyalty. How do we know? Because in every scriptural story, the bad, bad, bad guy is someone who betrayed their God. Loyalty is the highest spiritual law. You're in a spiritual relationship, so be loyal, 100% loyal. Don't think of another person. This part is the easy part. Don't think of other people, but also be loyal by being supportive, by being caring, by being understanding, compassionate, sympathetic. Those are also forms of loyalty. This is what I was talking about in the beginning. What are other ways of expressing your loyalty? And if you find that your mind is fighting back on you, this is the first thing we address in our course for women and our course for men, is learning how to govern that mind, govern the emotions, kick anger out of your being. Be you, you're a soul, you're pure, you're perfect, and you're with your soulmate. Rise above all the normal stuff. Be 100% loyal. I save the best for last. To me, it's the best because it's reflective of what I have been saying, that we are spiritual beings engaged in a spiritual relationship. And we should consider our marriage to be sacred, nothing less. And when you go to a church, synagogue, mosque, or sit on a rooftop and meditate, or on a mountaintop and meditate, when you're thinking about God and you're in that sacred space, you feel the joy well up in your life. And you realize that sacred equates to joyful. And your marriage is intended to be filled with joy. God loves us. God didn't create marriage to be a challenge. We've done this because we ignore the guardrails. We've never learned how to be married. I'm not blaming anybody for that. It's just the reality. We don't understand marriage. We need to understand marriage because the benefits that are derived from learning to love unconditionally, from living our marriages according to these seven rules is off the charts. Joy, walk in joy, be in joy, feel that joy with your soulmate. It's so beautiful, it's sacred, it's living, it's real. It is the highest reality that we have here, this relationship between us and our soulmate is unbelievable. You have to make it so. It doesn't just happen on its own. It's not a ride at a theme park. Marriage is something we need to learn so we can make it happen the way it's meant. You know what the three reasons we get married and the three goals of our marriage are happiness, love, and harmony. That's what you have when you know how. I'm Paul Friedman. I founded the Marriage Foundation to be of service to you so that you could learn how to be married, how to experience that joy. It's waiting for you. God bless you and take care.